Today, we're going to talk about how science on the big screen is portrayed and how it may unintentionally perpetuate some misconceptions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Just Now Science Podcast. Each episode, we debunk ridiculous yet common science misconceptions we find online and get just a little salty about them. I'm your favorite science teacher, Lauren. And I'm your favorite Hollywood neuroscientist, Nick. Before we get started, we would love it if you came and checked out our Instagram. We put out new cool science posts uh, pretty frequently. So you can find us at Science on Instagram. So TV and film need to be entertaining. And most of the time, the daily lives of scientists and doctors can be rather, well, boring. So for many internists, you tend to see the same diseases over and over. You prescribe the same drugs and you give many of the same recommendations. And that's why when an interesting case does come in, it can be really exciting. But unlike the hit TV show House, medical mysteries don't typically happen every week. Can we really just get into the tactics used in that show? Like, for example, you see whatever the, um, I don't remember the names, but the doctors that work with house they're like breaking into people's homes and like looking for clues on why someone has like phosphate toxins or something like whatever they're doing yeah right they'd be like um i don't give a shit my shift is over (laughs) no not even it's just it's illegal it's illegal they're not allowed to break in i don't care what you're doing a doctor at the hospital can't just break into someone's home and look for like pesticides or go into the basement to see if there's a lot of like mouse poop and then you get whatever disease you get from mouse poop that is a thing i i know no i know if you're in a closed space like a crawl space with a lot of mouse poop and urine and you inhale it a lot i forgot what that's called yeah yes, it is a thing so anyway so that's illegal um doing super risky procedures and giving experimental medications don't rely on the permission of a single person namely the chief of medicine this is something you see all the time like houses withholding treatment or or secretly does something extremely reckless and dangerous and is get, he the chief of medicine no the woman dr cuddy i don't remember her first name um she's the chief of medicine and he has to like get permission from her to do things it's like there are ethics committees there are regulatory chairs or boards there are department chairs like and then you also have i don't know the fda like they're pretty involved in things and in order to give experimental treatments or, or things like that, you need to file something with the FDA. Like you can't just go and do whatever you want. Even though it may actually be beneficial for the patient, there are rules that you have to follow. Thank you, Dr. Nick. Hi, everybody. <laughs> also, what are these doctors doing the rest of the time that... But that they... <laughs> Also, what are these doctors doing the rest of the time that they don't have a crisis case? It's, there's always a crisis, right? Do they ever see other patients? Because um, in these shows, a lot of times, the doctors are seen performing scratch tests, MRIs, and things that typically other techs or nursing staff would do. So, like, are they just that bored? Yeah, I don't I don't know. Maybe a radiologist would be involved with the MRI if it's a very particular case or something like that, but... Man, most of the time, just a routine MRI or CAT scan, it's, it's just going to, the tech's going to deal with the, a, a doctor who also isn't a radiologist won't be going to do the actual MRI First procedure. First, you wait seven hours to get the MRI, and then right. the tech is going to do it. Right. But speaking of doctors, one of my favorite shows of all times is the sitcom Scrubs. Great show, great show. There's there's a lot more stuff we could talk about House, including his very obvious addiction, his gruff attitude, and the way he handles patients and and authority, and he would be canned so fast, it's not even funny. I know, but TV loves, they they love doing shows where there's that, like, gruff and rough uh, doctor who just tells it like it is. Same thing with Scrubs and Dr. Cox. Well, I I do aspire to be Dr. Cox, but he, Dr. Cox and and, uh, House are Similar, but different. Anyway, Scrubs is one of my favorite shows of all time. And interestingly enough, Scrubs has been ranked one of the most medically accurate shows, even though it's a comedy, by medical professionals. It it most accurately, or is one of the most accurate shows that portray life in a hospital. And as someone who worked in a hospital, yeah, it's pretty good. (laughs) 
So, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about Scrubs, but there's one scene in particular that I have burned into my memory. I mean, I have a lot of scenes burned into my memory, but this one... Believe me, he does. <laughs> there is a scene. There is a scene. Uh, a patient needs to go into a clinical trial. So Dr. Cox, one of the main uh, senior doctors and one of the main characters, just puts this patient in the trial and he gets in trouble by his boss. Meanwhile, in order to get into a trial, there's a whole series of what we call inclusion and exclusion criteria that the patient must meet beforehand. You you don't just go into a clinical trial. You need to sign this paperwork. You need to have uh, for medical, right? Like if you're just doing like a questionnaire or something, it's different. But uh, if you are doing a medical or like a drug pharmaceutical sponsored clinical trial, there are criteria you have to meet you must meet a whole list of criteria and then you cannot meet a whole second list of criteria and it's very very detailed they're often pages long and you don't just go in but after his boss discovers this you know he yells at dr cox and tells him how much this mistake will cost the hospital because his boss is very concerned about money and but in reality patients uh, do get excluded from studies all the time, even if they were initially enrolled. We call this a screen failure. There's a screening period where you have to enroll a patient and see if they're eligible because you, you have to check like blood tests and all this kind of stuff before they can fully be enrolled in the study. So unless a patient was actively harmed or something happened in that study, there really wouldn't be any major consequences. Patients screen fail all the time. I've screen failed a lot of patients, probably more patients than I've enrolled in studies, just because these studies, the criteria are so specific that you can't just enroll anyone. It does get problematic if a study staff intentionally lies about patient data to get them into the study. That can be tricky. So what could happen if someone lies to get a patient in the study? It, it really depends on the... I don't want to say the severity because lying is lying and falsifying data is falsifying data. But if a patient just goes into a study and they don't do anything or, or there's no real risk or, or risk of harm, probably not much. The study staff might have to write like a, an action letter saying what happened, how it will be prevented in the future. Um, I'm sure it must suck to see a patient that has gone through every avenue and nothing works and you think maybe they have a shot at getting better with this clinical trial but you have to keep in mind that study is looking at something very specific so if you're throwing in um people who don't meet the criteria and it's not random um you can really throw off the data and then it could affect the outcome of the study so you have to kind of keep the big picture in mind too and i feel like even though it may be difficult you can't get caught up in in like the individual patients too much. Yeah, it, it's tough because I have seen that. I've seen many patients that the doctor feels would truly benefit from a study, but they, they don't qualify and we can't do it. Uh, people can get reported to the FDA. People can get banned or kicked off of studies and things like that. If they do harm a patient, it happens. Uh, it's, it's rare. But it, it can happen. Like I, re I remember you talking about you were doing like a wound care study. And it was so specific about the size of yeah. the wound. And some of these people have wounds that just won't heal for so long. There, there are patients who have a wound on their leg for months and months. And th this treatment could help. And right. And but, it, but if the wound like like shrunk showing that like it was improving or something yeah. too much they wouldn't I, I don't want to get into or... the study specifics because it's outside of the scope of this episode but yeah I they, know but it just it's it sucks. Gets really it's, it's tough it's it's tough so let's talk about another popular doctor though uh, not a medical doctor but archaeologist Indiana Jones I didn't know he was a doctor me neither but I mean I guess it makes sense I never really watched those movies yeah I mean but he has uh, his PhD right um so I'm sure many of you have heard of him. And I have no doubt that Indiana Jones inspired a large number of people to at least become interested in archaeology. Um, it definitely has had a major influence on how the public perceives archaeology, uh, which can be a good thing. But again, I'm, it's obviously not exact. Um, but in the fourth Indiana Jones movie, um, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, he survives a nuclear explosion by hiding in a refrigerator. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I can think of that scene. Like, he, isn't he in this, like, fake town? Have, he doesn't really realize what's going on. I have no idea. And then he hears them, like, count down for the test nuclear bomb. It's, like, in the middle of the desert or something. And so he panics, and he's just like, oh, fuck. You know, he just empties out the fridge and, and, and gets in there. I promise that won't save you. <laughs> So even if you did manage to survive that blast, that lingering radiation would still penetrate the fridge and kill you. Maybe not then and there, but it will. Um, radiation days, sickness will get you. <laughs> um, a couple of weeks, but it, given his proximity to the explosion, it'd probably be more like a week or so. Um, and even Steven Spielberg, who directed the movie, jokingly called it his silly mistake. Yeah. Um, but my question is, if you are actually find yourself in that situation which weird don't know why you would be what should you do try to get as far away as possible as fast you can there there is but if no you're like they're literally counting down you're no, like, I, I got 10 seconds i think i might jump in the fridge too i i know but you don't want to be stuck in the in the in the radiation zone in the exclusion zone you need to get away you need to get as much distance as you can maybe and you if you hear the countdown you hide as far like under as much cover as you can to survive the initial blast but then you gotta go i know but i thought i read somewhere that like after something like that you want to stay inside for the first 24 hours and avoid opening any windows mm -hmm. or, yeah but i don't know how i mean it really depends on how close you are if you're just outside the blast zone it doesn't matter if you're inside that's gonna that's gonna penetrate I, yeah i guess because we also just watched Chernobyl not that long ago. Quarantine, we've been crushing every show <laughs> there is out there. Um, and it was really interesting just to see. I know, again, it's a show, but just to see like the portrayal of the effects, the health effects of people who were in Chernobyl and, and were close to it and were actually at the building, like some of the firefighters that night. Think about it like this. In, in the show, Chernobyl, at the end, they talk about the firefighters clothing after all the firefighters who were helping put out the initial fire uh were brought to a nearby hospital mm -hmm. they realized the radiation was still on them and they had to get all their clothes into the basement of the hospital right and so they they basically went down there they stripped them of all their clothes everything because their clothes were radioactive and those clothes are still in the basement of that hospital and are still Radioactive. Uh, radioactive. Like this, you could still pick them up on a Geiger counter. Yeah, that's that's how strong these. I mean, yeah. what I year did this happen? Eighty six. I, I don't. Yes. Sometime in the eighties. I um, don't know. But yeah, that's how 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 strong this is. So yeah, I mean, I think if you're Indiana Jones in that moment, you just gotta know like, this is it? If the initial blast doesn't get me, the radiation will. Yeah. And I, it's, ugh, a horrible death. Okay, moving on to something a little more positive. And, <laughs> and while we're on the subject of things that are old, Jurassic Park has always been a movie that I have had a lot of issues with. He sucks all the fun out of it. I, I really do, but it's like, why do you keep making this theme park? <laughs> like, after the, the first time is cool, novel, exciting, and then it goes wrong, and you're like, we could do it better. And they keep doing it. I know. But specifically, the thing that I, that bothers me the most is the resurrection of dinosaurs through the idea of cloning them. Now, we successfully cloned Dolly the sheep back in the 1990s. What you might not know is that there were dozens of failed attempts before we had our successful one. And Dolly... If you want to call six Dolly successful. Right. And just in this, I mean, successful in the cloning. Right. But Dolly was plagued by several medical conditions that shortened her lifespan and made it a little harder uh, to live than other sheep had. Um, cloning is an eloquent. <laughs> Shut up. I feel bad about it, okay? I, I really do. Cloning is an incredibly difficult procedure that we still don't have mastery of. So getting a, like many dinosaurs that aren't sick or don't have crazy short lifespans isn't something that we can do right now. Yeah, and... and and not to mention, like, all the different species of dinosaurs right. just a little crazy. And it's partly because we don't have the technology to do it, but mostly because, like, we don't have dinosaur DNA, and we need the full sequence in order to clone it, and we don't have that, so, like, it's literally impossible. Also, dinosaurs had feathers, and we talked a lot about them in Season 1, Episode 37, so if you want to hear more bad science about dinosaurs, check out that episode. 
Um, but I also have a gripe with this because it just reminds me of that a-hole, Exotic Joe from Tiger King, who would often say that he was breeding the saber-toothed tiger back into existence. And, like, that's not how that works. You can't just, like, inbreed a bunch of tigers and expect to get the saber-toothed tiger. You just inbred a bunch of tigers is all you did. Yeah, none of that is good for anyone or anything. Yeah, or Especially the tigers. Yeah, so it just pisses me off. Yeah, what, what does he think is going to happen? then? The DNA from saber two tigers is going to magically appear in a no, tiger? He doesn't understand no, I, I know, anything about DNA, what, what that would entail. What does he think would happen? I don't know. And I don't know if he was like breeding, let's say, tigers and lions. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if he was crossbreeding or, or interbreeding species. I Who knows? Who knows what this lunatic was thinking? But if that was the case, wouldn't just like breeding over and over again humans, couldn't you say, oh, we're going to we're going to get the Neanderthals back just by breeding. Yeah. Like, no, it doesn't make sense. No, no, it doesn't. You know what else is impossible? <laughs> Using only 10% of your brain. Yet, it's a really common plot device seen in movies like Lucy and Limitless. If you're not familiar, the idea is that humans only use a fraction of our brain power and some deeper power or intelligence lies within for those who can access it. In these movies, individuals have incredible intelligence. In Lucy, the main character can master a martial art just by watching it. Even though in the real world, mastery of something like a martial art is done by years and years of training, and that's something I can personally attest to. <laughs> this, I'm sure this is a serious sore spot for Nick in that movie. It makes me so mad, but learning in the real world uses several parts of your brain to create memories, consolidate them, and then be able to recall them. The memory center of the brain is called the hippocampus, which is Greek for seahorse. No, I am not making that up. Why? Why, though? Because it doesn't it, even really look like a seahorse. Yeah, I know. I know. But whatever, you know. Greeks just do what they do. They, yeah, they, they be doing their thing. <laughs> uh, so the, the hippocampus isn't the only thing responsible for memory, but uh, on top of the hippocampus, you have connections between the brain and the muscles. And these connections, these nervous tissue connections, can be strengthened through frequent activation, which is when the idea of practice makes perfect comes into play. Hmm. These connections can get strengthened in a couple of different ways, like increasing the amount of neurotransmitter that's released. You can increase the number of receptors that the neurotransmitters bind to. There's different molecular mechanisms in which uh, learning and increasing efficiency in different neural pathways can happen. This is why something like your first armbar, if you're doing, say, jiu-jitsu, isn't as good as your hundredth armbar. The repeated activation of those neural pathways is what drives the ability for us to be better at things. I never actually saw the movie Limitless, but I did see Lucy. And I can say at the end, she just becomes so powerful, she just, like, turns into a supercomputer. Okay, that I'm makes... like, what... <laughs> Uh, now she's very good at chess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in the, the, one, the one thing about Limitless that I liked is that it, it was based on a drug. And that drug, like, oh, opened your brain up in ways that, like, previously Oh, so wasn't. acid. I, no, like, in, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Kind of probably the closest thing we could say. Imagine if I, you combined acid and Ritalin. And that's probably something like the, the limitless drug. Uh, but it had pretty serious health consequences. And so by using it, not only do you get really addicted, but it really shortens your lifespan. And um, so I'm sure you like that give and take aspect. To yes, it. I did. But it was still ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I feel you. And lastly, we can't forget about movies that talk about climate science. So much about the environment, weather and climate is either misunderstood or misinterpreted for these movies. So a great example of this is the movie 2012, which was a disaster movie. Basically, the plot... Uh, Some could also say a disaster of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> touché, touché. Um, so the plot basically is the world is ending because the Earth's crust is heating up and erupting, causing a cataclysm. Um, so in the movie, the reason is because um, neutrinos. neutrinos in the Earth's core are mutating. I don't even know nearly what that's supposed to mean. It means nothing. It's gibberish. <laughs> um, and it's so nonsensical that NASA said it was an exceptional ex and extraordinary case 
for the worst use of science in a movie. <laughs> yeah, NASA was not happy about that. It was like, this doesn't even mean anything. Um, but really, this was... So if you guys remember back in 2012, this there was that doomsday prediction from the Mayan calendar that December 21st, 2012, there was going to be like this apocalypse. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and so that was the year we graduated college. And so like that December, I was like, man, I've only been in the real world six months. <laughs> what the hell? Um, so I did some digging, and the History Channel said it was that that prediction was based off of a faulty translation of an ancient Mayan tablet. It probably read 2020 instead of 2012, I'm just saying. Well, it's officially 2021, so and the world didn't end, although it might have felt like it did. <laughs> Um, but then it makes me think, like, how many other things have we mistranslated and... The entire Bible. Yeah, it caused, like, a whole hoopla about. But it is... The movie is just so ridiculous. Like, I have just rewatched the trailer to kind of refresh myself on it. And it just has, like, entire cities. And it looks like, like New York or Chicago, like, some major silly city just falling into the sea. So I, I guess it was trying to say, like, the continental shelf was breaking up, but... I, I don't know. This would not happen. No, we don't live on a very thin piece of floating land. That's not a con. We have millions of years of rock under us. Look up the rock cycle, people. I'm, I'm not going to. Um, yeah. So that just that just pisses me off. Um, and then there's another movie like that, The Day After Tomorrow, with Emma Rossum and Jake Gyllenhaal and Dennis Quaid. Wow. <laughs> so it was based on the idea that. Uh, they took a little bit of science, right? They mentioned the North Atlantic Current, which is about as scientific as it got. <laughs> they said it was being disrupted by melting ice of the polar caps. And there is a lot of scientific debate as to what would happen if this current was disrupted. You know, the Gulf Stream goes from basically the Gulf area um, in the southwest United States and like the north of the Caribbean. And that warm current, ocean current goes all the way up towards like northern Europe. So that's why London is often very foggy and is a little bit warmer there than you normally would think for its latitude. And some people say, oh, if that were disrupted, it would turn to an ice age up there. But probably not quite. And this movie obviously took it to an extreme. You know, Dennis Quaid plays the ignored paleontologist, even though it probably would be a climatologist. Um, it leads to <laughs> minor detail. Yeah, um, you know he's like running through the White House, like Vice President, we have to act now. I'm like nobody let you in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have security clearance? Yeah, um, but this thing, like in like in like a second, everything flips, and it leads to like multiple natural disasters simultaneously, like a tsunami in Manhattan followed by a tornado and three week torrential downpours. It's like okay. If it were really torrentially downpouring in Manhattan for three weeks, it would not be business as usual. Those sewers would be overflowing. Oh, like, yeah. Ugh, it would be, there was so much flooding. It'd like, it looked nightmare. like a normal rainy day. That would not happen. Can you imagine if you don't live in New York City or have never taken the New York City subway after like oh, a rainstorm? Oh, God, yes. Oh, God, it's the worst. After Those... one, during one downpour, it's like it's like a waterfall in the subway station. Seriously. And then trains get delayed. Imagine three weeks nonstop torrential downpour. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, they're saying this in the movie that it causes the world to go into an ice age. But then everyone just evacuates to the south where it's still warm and normal. But if this were a true ice age, there would be global cooling. So it was said that in the last ice age, the average global temperature was six degrees cooler than today. Which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but it is actually huge. Wait, wait. Everybody just moves to the southern hemisphere? I don't, I don't think southern hemisphere. Or the south looks like, of the country? I think the south of the country. <laughs> But it gets to be like 30 degrees or 40 degrees in like North, South Carolina. Like, I know. Why would... <laughs> well, we can't even say the Southern Hemisphere because if you go really south in the Southern Hemisphere, it's very cold too. So it's like everyone meeting up at the equator. I don't know. I'm not really sure how that works. Because all these states and stuff have the infrastructure to handle just New York City alone. Yeah, I know. It's. I guess that doesn't include all the people who dude. die from whatever. Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense, obviously, but... Um, if let's say we did have to do a mass evacuation, it would also be a nightmare in real life too. So 
Just saying. Um, yeah, and, and in fact, in that last ice age, the northern parts of the northern hemisphere in Europe were pretty much all covered in ice. So that's six degrees globally is a big difference. That's why we're fighting to prevent global warming from getting out of control now because we're worried about a four degree increase because of the massive amount of implications that could have. So even though it doesn't seem like a lot, these degrees do have major impact on things. It wouldn't necessarily cause, you know, like all this shit happening in like three seconds, but it would be life, uh, long-term impacts. And the very last thing we're going to talk about in this podcast episode is that since things don't happen instantly, the movie Armageddon. There's suddenly an asteroid the size of Texas. Wait, is that the one with um, Where they send Ben Affleck? A, I don't know. I think Ben Affleck and Liv Tyler. I have no idea. Yeah. What I do know is they send a team up to the asteroid and like one guy has to stay in the ship. Isn't that um who what movie was this? Was this Armageddon? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, Armageddon, I'm pretty sure, has Ben Affleck in it. Okay. Well there's a movie where the there's an asteroid the size of Texas that's like three days away from annihilating the planet. Like, damn, NASA, what were you doing? Now you let it get three days away. <laughs> That's the thing. It would be we would know years ahead. Yeah. We would know years ahead. And it would not just be uh three days. And also if even if we did have three days, I don't think we'd be able to do it. Yeah, no way. Um also a lot of asteroids and things like that tend to burn up in the mesosphere layer of the atmosphere. That's where you see shooting stars. But I don't know. I guess obviously some are big enough that they do get through. I don't really know how that works. You yeah. should ask the dinosaurs. <laughs> wow. Okay. Let's just breed them back in. Let's just breed a bunch of lizards together and get the dinosaurs <laughs> back up in okay. here. Okay. Okay. That's going to do it for us today. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and especially share it. It takes literal seconds to hit subscribe and click the five star review button, and it would mean a whole lot to us. Positive ratings and shares. I have to do that over. Positive ratings and shares on social media are the biggest ways you can help us spread this good, good science to even more people. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at JustNASScience. You can also visit our website, JustNASScience.com, where you can watch YouTube videos, read blog posts, or submit questions and suggest topics for future episodes. And don't forget, we put out new episodes every Tuesday. Thanks again for listening, guys. Later, nerds. Later, Gator. <laughs>